Paul, the theme for our TEDx this year is your city, your design. And we're anxious to hear your, your vision uh, about that topic. But most people in our audience have not met you. And I thought we could dig back a little bit and give people a, a look at Paul Foster. Um, you were born in Snyder, Texas, but right. since nobody knows where that is, we'll skip till you were two and you moved to Lovington. <laughs> Spent your formative years in Lovington until you graduated from high school. And right. in, your, in your high school annual is a photograph of you and underneath it's the boy uh, voted most likely to succeed. I have a question. How did they know? Um, what did you do in Lovington that gave the high school some premonition that Paul Foster would be successful? Um, well, I don't know. I, I, I always worked from the time I was a very young child. I always trying to figure out how to make money, most of it honestly, and, and uh, <laughs> had a paper route when I was 11 years old, and I sold fireworks, and I made candles, and I, I did all kinds of sort of unusual things, but I was always trying to make money, and I, and I, and I don't really know why. It wasn't like I needed money, but, but uh, I think I just was a little bit in a very small way, very entrepreneurial from a, from a very young age. So I picture this all-American boy in Lovington, lots of friends and riding bicycles. What's the worst thing you ever did as a kid? Oh, gosh. Um, well, that you can tell us about. Yeah, there's one kind of embarrassing one where we, uh, three, three of my good friends and I all got BB guns for, for Christmas. And so we went out in this pasture way out behind our house a couple of miles and came across this, this, this farm. And we knew the farmer. Of course, everybody was a small town. Everybody knew everybody. And we had these new BB guns. And we started with this chicken ran across. And we started shooting at it, and of course none of us knew how to shoot, and all of a sudden this chicken just fell dead. And I'm not going to say who was, made the fatal shot, uh, but we were horribly embarrassed and didn't know what to do, and we, were, we ran home and, you know, of course didn't tell our parents or anything, and we had a substitute teacher on Monday morning. Uh, I got a regular teacher was, was not, I guess was sick or whatever, and the substitute teacher was the wife of this farmer. And we thought they knew. And so, anyway, that was, uh, that was one very scary thing. We thought we were all going to prison for killing a chicken, but. Uh. <laughs> well, we're glad you did it. Um, you graduated from high school, uh, entered Baylor uh, as a pre-med student, and then graduated four years later uh, with a degree in accounting. That's another story unto itself. but. Um, once you graduated, you went through a series of about six jobs and ended up at El Paso Refinery in 1990 as, a, as the controller and, and uh, marketing manager. At that time, uh, it was your first time in El Paso, and then two years later that company went bankrupt. Right. And here you were in El Paso, Texas, 35 years old. Um, recently removed from a difficult marriage, two young children, and broke. What was going on in your head? Well, it was, it was a tough time. It was uh, in the refining business. There were a lot of refineries going broke, and, and so it was a tough business to be in. It's something I had chosen to do, and, and now I was having doubts about whether this was really the industry I wanted to be in. And so I started you know, brushing up the resume and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, and I was virtually convinced that, that I was going to find a different industry. Um, and, and then the, uh, the refinery had, had gone bankrupt, went chapter seven. It was a really nasty bankruptcy, never restarted. And so everybody got laid off. We went from 400 employees down to, I think, five. And so I was one of the five, but still, it didn't look good. And, uh, um, and the banks that had, had the big, the lion's share of the debt ended up foreclosing and took ownership of this asset. And so I started looking at that and I'm like, These, they don't know what to do with this. And so 
I put a little business plan together and, and basically persuaded them that they needed me to help them manage this asset that they had sort of accidentally acquired. And, and it all started from there. You ended up buying the refinery in 2000? Is that when it was? Yeah, well, first we, we put a, a management company together and, and managed the asset for the refinery. And it was all very complicated because Chevron had a refinery across the street. And we put a deal together with them to manage and operate the two together. And then it became apparent to me that, that nobody wanted to own these assets. Chevron didn't want it. The banks didn't want it. And I saw a lot of value there. And I was like, I got to figure out how to do this. And the problem is I didn't have any money. And um, so it was you know, not an easy thing to accomplish. But I immediately started working on trying to come up with a plan uh, probably in 1997, started working on trying to figure out a way to put this thing together and buy it. And, then, and it only worked if you bought both of them. You couldn't just buy one because they, they were in, you know, permanently tied together. Um, and so it was, it was very complicated trying to figure out how to, how to put it all together and finance it. Well, we're glad you did. Um, over the years, Paul, you have bought real property and, and built things in this community and everything from the Foster Stevens basketball complex to the Fountains at Farrah, the Mills Building, the Center Building, uh, the Plaza Hotel, the Blue Flame Building, so many real assets that you have purchased and, and, and renovate and preserve, uh, which is a great story for our community. But somewhere in your career, uh, you had to have stopped and said, whoa, I'm making a lot of money. What am I going to do with it? it, it is, is there a time that that happened and you, and, and you, de you decided what you were going to do in El Paso? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when, when we started having success with the refinery and, and uh, we decided to take it public, become a public company, and so we, we were able to monetize some of this investment that we'd made over the years, um, yeah, I started trying to figure out you know, how do I give back to this, not, not just to this community, but to the sort of the, the, the vehicles along the way that helped me to get to where I am. And, you know, I, I've always felt like I wanted to give back to El Paso because this is where I had most of my success. Uh, same with, you know, Baylor where I went to, to college and, and other places, I just have felt um, not obligated in any way, but I felt like I really wanted to try to improve and give back to those institutions that helped me get to where I am. Certainly El Paso is a much better place, um, which brings us to the theme today that uh, a lot of your investments in giving has a lot to do with what you saw in 1990 when you were here and 2017. Where's El Paso going in your mind? Um, I think, and I think most people feel it, I think El Paso is, is, is really in a, in a good place right now. It's a great time to be here. I think we have a great future ahead of us. We're just getting started. Um, in, in terms of downtown, you can feel the energy. You can, you can see the development. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. It takes some vision. and. And we all need to work together. Um, but I, I feel like El Paso is, is already a great city, but poised to be uh, just a fantastic city as, as we move forward. I think Juarez is a huge uh, component of that. Uh, we have a very unusual situation. I think we're the largest sort of binational city in the, in the world. Um, and, and not just by a national, but we're separated by, by a border, but, but our population is very uh, homogenous. We're very mixed. We, you know, we marry across the border. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's very fluid, and people go back and forth and very comfortable. And, of course, after 9-11, that's not as easy as it used to be. But uh, we need to continue to figure out ways to capitalize on that. And I just think um, that, that, that these two cities 
uh, can be fantastic if we, if we do things the right way. So in that light, give us one big idea that you, that you would like to see both cities pursue. Well, I think that if, if you look at, at the, the area down by the, the bridge, the downtown bridge, or bridges, um, on both sides of the border, um, the development hasn't been great. You know, there's some business there, but it's, it, it's disjointed. Um, what I think is that there, on both sides of the border, there should be a sort of a Mercado type environment. Um, the cities need to work together. They need to create a safe zone so people feel safe going to both sides and, and back and forth. You need to have bars and restaurants. You need to have, I mean, even the pink store. I mean, and most of us have been to the pink store out at Columbus. Little Columbus, New Mexico, you know, they've got it. How do we not have something like that here? It's just amazing to me that we don't have the shopping and the, and the dining and the, and the bars. When, when, when people come to this town, like even, you know, the University of Arizona was here last night to play ball. I guarantee you, most of the fans that came from Tucson wanted to go to Juarez. I mean, you don't go to the border without wanting to cross and see, see what's over there. And I don't know if very many of them did, but the fact is, it's not as easy as it ought to be. Um, and, and there ought to be a concerted effort by both sides, by the business communities and the political communities on both sides to make this a binational, tourist destination where people want to go. And, and I, think, I think it can be accomplished, it can be safe. I don't even think it costs that much money. You've, you've, you've got the properties, we just need to, to, to get the business community and, the, and the, uh, the legislators, city council, state legislators, whatever, whatever is necessary to, to focus on it, make it a priority you have to work with the federal government, and make the bridge crossing experience a little bit better. Um, and you know, they have, they have to worry about security and I get that, but they could still, it could still be a better experience crossing the bridge. And um, I, I just think it's a fantastic opportunity. That's a, it, it's a fabulous idea and it's one that's been discussed about putting a Mercado there. Uh, uh, one of the big questions is always safety and you address that. But since you live with the Cabinet Secretary for Innovation and Commerce, is that really possible in, in what is? Oh, I think it's absolutely possible. Um, I mean, why is it? I mean, you look at, first of all, people think that, that we live in such a dangerous place. And I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I tell people I live in El Paso and they're like, oh my God, you know, are you able to stay safe? And I'm like, we're the safest large city in America every single year. And those are FBI statistics. Those are not Chamber of Commerce statistics. And San Diego is almost always number two. And it's not a coincidence that the two safest cities in America are on the border. And on the other side of the border, granted, they have uh, issues that have to be dealt with. And, and, and we have drug violence that kind of comes up and down or whatever but they absolutely have the ability to create a safe zone, to make people feel safe. Um, and and, and, and I, believe, I believe this is something that could be done. You know, we also, also have the soccer team over there that's also right on the border. It's only about a mile from downtown. And you look at that whole area, and if you develop it the right way, it could just be fantastic for, for both sides of the border. It would be a big vision for El Paso and Juarez to pursue together. I want to, uh, we're running out of time, but I want to wrap up with this. You're on a, 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 the side sometimes, Paul, of a lot of controversy. Uh, the ballpark, uh, the bond issues. Uh, I know how you feel about Duranguito. What should, El, in your mind, what should El Paso stop doing to, to attain a global city distinction? I think we need to stop um Stop beating each other up. We need, we need to all row in the same direction. You know, my view is that we can improve this city if we do it together. And, um, 
you know, you, you, you mentioned the Durangito situation. Um, you know, I know there are a lot, of, a lot of passionate feelings about that. But the truth is that the buildings that are there are not buildings that need to be saved. There are probably 30 trost buildings in El Paso. Um, you can't save all 30 trost buildings. If you want to improve downtown, if you want to have a great downtown, concentrate on the ones that it makes sense to improve. And the others, you might just have to let a few go. And there's, that, that's OK. And uh, if Trost was still alive, I think he'd probably tell you that. Um, you, you, you look at, at uh, you, you, you mentioned, you know, what do, we, what do we need to do different? Or, or how can, yeah, what do we need to quit doing? And, and it kind of reminds me of the, the old analogy you hear about the, the bucket with the, with the lobsters in it. You have a big bucket and you have lobsters and one of them starts climbing up. And he's making progress and he's going to do some great things. And right before he gets to the top, the others grab him and pull him back down. And then they, they start beating each other up and in fact they start eating each other. And somebody else starts trying to make it to the top and they pull them down. And what they ought to be doing is helping each other get to the top. And then when this guy gets to the top, he reaches down and helps the next one up. And I just am a big believer in trying to collaborate, trying not to have a lot of controversy, and trying to accomplish great things together. Paul, we're, uh, as I said, El Paso is a better place because of you and Alejandra, and, and I know you, you both flew back today to, to be with us on the TEDx stage. It's an honor to have you here, so it's a good place to stop. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. My pleasure.